See, I have come to think about this as God's circle of his redeeming love, of his grace, and of his presence. Because see, if we think about what has been made perfectly complete, and this is what I call God's circle, is God's love was always for us. And he always was trying to redeem us back to himself. And his prophets went and spoke his message and said, well, I'll be sending someone. We read some of that today. And this Messiah will come in a certain way and he will redeem you. So of these prophecies that predicted what, was, what God was about to do and was going to do, then came in reality through Jesus' life, of course with his birth. And as we see that, it kept going around into a circle. And we think the birth, the life, the predictions, and back around again. And all of these things that God all along was telling his people the way to redeem us, it continued to be formed in his everlasting sense of eternity in this circle. Um, so, first week is preparing the purpose. So as we enter Advent, and we think about this whole connection of Christmas and all the things with it, how do we prepare with the purpose? Preparing is great, right? Don't we like to be prepared? I always say we do our best to prepare. Whatever else happens, that's the way the Lord uh, ordained it. But I do like to prepare. It's good to be prepared. But distractions or distractions get in the way many times. Many times things take us away from what we want to do. And um, next thing you know, we're doing something else. We lost our focus of what we were prepare preparing for. So I'm going to pick something different every week. And when we think about the holiday season and Christmas, what can spin us up like nothing else? What can make us go in circles like none other? Well, I'm picking on very first this week, shopping. Amen. <laughs> so we picked it right, right? Um, but there's so many, but shopping can really get us distracted. It can get us away from sometimes really preparing our hearts as we think about for Christmas. And it doesn't matter now. I know they talk about so much online shopping or whether you go to the malls and shop. You know, what to get? Is it wrapped? Will they like it? Do I have the time? What will it cost? Um, or maybe even like me sometimes, I tend to start to really dislike it. And as I see the different things going around, but you know, sometimes Christmas gifts have certain meanings, but yet we see this commercialism of it, and then maybe sometimes we just don't like any of it. Um, so can and will this take away from us preparing with a purpose for the true meaning of Christmas, or this sense of Advent? Um, of course, the baby in the manger, but you know, Advent also recognizes for us the second coming again when Christ said he would come again. Um, or do we really allow sometimes things like this? And I got a 15 second clip I want to show you from the NBC News and see if this preparation would help us um, in our true sense of that. If you could. <laughs> something that did not involve curse words, um, punching, wrestling on the ground. Go home and look at that online and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but again, do these type of things come forth from when we think about preparing? So um, how do we prepare with purpose? How do we really prepare ourselves? Well, uh, let's take a lesson from John the Baptist. That was our reading today. Um, and John the Baptist, what's John the Baptist? What's that really mean um, to our Christmas, if you will, our connection? Our first reading we had in Isaiah, Isaiah 40 said that there's this voice, this one will be coming, crying out in the wilderness, make your path straight. And he says, the glory of the Lord will be revealed in him. Isaiah 40. Then we see in Malachi 3, 1, see, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord who, Lord who we seek he will suddenly come. And then it goes on to Malachi to say, The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight indeed is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So we have our Old Testament prophecies, and then we see in Mark, and I want to go to Mark briefly too, we see where it combines Malachi and Isaiah. And in Mark 1, we'll start in verse 2, and it, it recounts that a prophecy from Isaiah, and it goes on to identify this messenger. And it says in verse 4 of Mark 1, John the baptizer, he appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. And now in Matthew, let's take a look at Matthew. Then in Matthew, we'll go to chapter 3, and we see 
right at the beginning of chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then we go on to see again this prophecy about Isaiah. I hope you're beginning to see that connection of what we're talking about from Old Testament scriptures of this, um, the, the foreshadowing of Christ and John the Baptist, this one coming to prepare the people for this coming. And then we see it being realized again in our New Testament scriptures. In this messenger's message, this messenger's message was what? To prepare the way. Prepare the way that the Lord was coming. This thing was prophesied so long ago is now coming and is here. And none other than John the Baptist is chosen as the messenger. And why do I say that? John the Baptist was considered a misfit. Um, he was a throwback prophet of old. He was dressed in a leather belt and camel's hair. We have our circle before me today in honor of John the Baptist. If you've not realized that yet, wrapped in leather, and the burlap and the clothing and the things that we knew he wore that uh, most people shunned away from. Um, and I love in there we read he ate locust and wild honey. See, wild honey is an important thing to consider. Especially for my, as you know, you, those that know me, I, you know, I'm a beekeeper of sorts. And I wear suits when I touch those bees. When they talk about wild honey in the Old Testament times, trust me, my friends, they did not have one of protective gear. They kind of dug right into the hive and grabbed their honey. That is John the Baptist. Now proclaiming this message and preparing the way of the Lord. And see, that's why this is an Advent text. To prepare. Advent means the coming or the arrival, Latin word. But to prepare and the coming. Yes, we prepare for the birth of Christ. But do not let it be lost on you during this season. We are not only just celebrating the birth of the Savior, which is so important to do. We are also preparing to think about when Christ said, I will come again. That is what they call many times um, as a second advent or a second coming. As Christ said, he would come again. So don't ever let this holiday season as we celebrate the birth just be lost in that sense of, yes, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, which we do. It's so important. It's so um, great for us to do and remember but also remember um, that Christ said he will come again. And that second advent is something that we also prepare for. So John the Baptist proclaimed, we read a little bit in Matthew, repent and forgiveness. Um, forgiveness of sin that he said what I love, to bear fruit of repentance. What's it mean to bear fruit of repentance? Fruit of repentance. Well, let's not worry. Let's not worry about me making it up either. Um, let's go to Luke. And we can trust in God's word of this sense of bearing fruit of repentance. Because in Luke 3, we read about John the Baptist as he's talking about bearing fruit worthy of repentance. As he's still in Luke preparing the way. Again, another piece of this connection. And I'm going to share a lot of scripture throughout the series. Because it's important to connect all these dots that we're talking about. There's going to be a connection. We need to say it. And we've already read it in the Old Testament of this today, at least, of what's going on with this one to prepare the way, which was John the Baptist. And now John the Baptist appears, he's, he's talking about preparing the way, and the one that will come, he says, I'm not worthy to, to untie the sandal. And when he talked about bearing the fruit, the crowds asked him, I'm in Luke 3 and 10, and it says, and the crowds asked him, what should we do? And then in verse 11, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share one um, with someone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. And then even the tax collectors, they get into it, well, what, what, what should we do? You know, and he says to them, um, do not collect more tax than what you should. Um, and to um, do not take more for yourself. And then the soldiers come into it in verse 14. The soldiers say to him, well, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats, false accusations. And he says, to be satisfied with the wages that you have. John the Baptist gave very clear, concrete examples to these people about to how to bear these fruits worthy of repentance. There's nothing worse um, than hearing to go do something and having no real marching orders on how to do it. Um, I work very hard uh, every week up here to try to not do that. And um, if I fail on that, I apologize and ask for your grace and forgiveness now. But I work hard to make us understand what do we leave here with to accomplish what God is asking us to do or 
what we need to do as Christians, as a faith. So um, John the Baptist gave him clear examples. And of course, many people said, oh, he, he's got to be demon-possessed. He can't be God's agent. He, the way he dresses, the way he acts, the things he is saying. Um, but he did. And he was called. It was his job. Called by God to prepare the way of the Lord. So as I come, if you will, full circle, back to us today. We heard what John the Baptist told the crowds, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. So now, thousands of years later, as we prepare for yet again another Christmas season, how do we truly prepare for Christmas with purpose? And when I say prepare, I'm talking about preparing in our hearts, in our minds, in our soul, and in all that we do. How do we prepare? You know, these examples of John the Baptist are every bit as concrete for us also. Um, to put it maybe in terminology we think of now, ask for forgiveness. To forgive others. Serve others. And if you think about all the answers that he gave, and now I just read through Luke, all those answers that he gave, they talk about a lifestyle. They talk about a lifestyle that is not one of to accumulate. How much can I get? How much more can I stack on? He did not talk about a life to accumulate, because what did he say? If you have two coats and someone needs one, give them that one. Or if they need food and you have enough food, Give that, not to accumulate, but to help, to give to others in need. Um, concern for neighbor always comes to my mind because we think of Jesus as he summed up the Ten Commandments and to love God and to love your neighbor. So all of these things that John the Baptist is telling us to do as the Lord is coming, he's saying prepare. And he's preparing the way for the Lord. And then they ask, well, how do we do this? And he talks to them exactly about that. Repent. Because when Christ comes, and he's looking for um, ultimately, what we did with our lives. Um, John the Baptist, in my words, always kind of stayed in his lane. And what do I mean by that? See, John the Baptist was called to prepare the way for Christ, and that's what he did. Even in the midst, and we can read throughout the Gospels, as Jesus started to, to, uh, to teach and get out more and about, and as they were baptizing more people, a lot of John the Baptist fathers say, what? What about us? I mean, there's many times John the Baptist could have stood up and said, no, no, I, I, this is me. I want to do more. But John the Baptist always stepped down. And he says, no, this is not. I am preparing the way for the one. And I am not that person. He did what he was called to do. And he did it without looking for anything further than what his role and his purpose was. What's our role and what's our purpose? And do we stay in our lane and do that? Or are we always looking for the next thing that maybe someone else is doing? John knew his role, he saw it, and he did it. Even to the point when people were coming to him and saying things, he says, no, no, I must decrease. And he, meaning the one, the Lord, the one he prepared the way for must increase. That's a very humbling thought, is it not? I must decrease, and he must increase. That's a thought to take with us, and I take it with me often. Um, so as we think about this today, I ask that we come to the Lord's table. That we come to the Lord's table um, with a repentant heart. To ask forgiveness. Um, to come to the, to the table thinking of ways to renew our spirit. To ways to prepare and be ready to celebrate this idea of Christ coming again, but yes, also in His second coming. But I ask that we do that during this time of communion today. To think about that. Um, Ask God to show you if you don't know. Um, and just ask for that sense of repentance. And as we celebrate this day by attention, you know, many times there's, I know there's a lot going on, but you have time in your seats. And I ask you to take that time in your seats to do exactly that. To consider all that's going on in your lives and what you can do to do none, to do none other than to prepare yourself with purpose for this season. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. God, we thank you again for the lessons that you teach. We thank you for um, those that were called by you, Lord, and um, they did exactly what you asked them to do. And we've seen that in John the Baptist this day, and as he called for this sense um, of you were coming, Lord. Let us uh, understand that. Let us, in our lives, prepare for that. And let us be ready to share that love uh, with others. Let us be ready to share all that we have uh, with them, of course, to show your love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.